am i audible first of all uh, a reaction yeah. uh yeah i hope i'm audible clearly so i hope you enjoyed the previous sessions and i hope uh, you'll enjoy this one too uh to start off uh, i'm shrijan and i'm someone who's very interested in like the uh, interdisciplinary field of like uh, machine learning in natural sciences uh and yeah today's topic is on uh, physics inspired computation uh yeah i'll start uh, presenting now Is the screen visible? Yes. So to start off this session, I would like to share this quote. Uh, Every problem has a solution. It may sometimes just need another perspective. So this is something like I, uh, when I read this quote, I felt, oh yeah, this is uh, very true. It's like there are a lot of problems that you may face, not just in academics or some uh, particular problem but anywhere there might be a solution somewhere else and this is the kind of thing that we'll be looking at today and first of all i would like to start off with the completely unrelated but somewhat related to this uh, thing here so invention of velcro so you may think Invention of Velcro, what does that have to do with physics-inspired computation? So I just want to show that some problems can be solved using inspired from something else. So this guy, George de Mestrel, uh, he went on a hunting trip in 1940s. And while returning back from that hunting trip, he saw that his, uh, his socks, his coat, and also the fur of fur of his dog. They were all covered with something, uh, a burdock seeds. And that made him think, can I design something that sticks just like how this burdock seeds stick? And that is how Velcros were born. And now Velcros are everywhere, as you might know. So now, Let's go to nature inspired computing. Like how has nature inspired in a particular field that is computing? So there are mainly three types of uh, how nature has inspired computing. One is how has nature inspired to develop novel problem solving techniques that we'll be discussing much more in detail today. Uh, use of computer to synthesize natural phenomena is basically uh, simulations and everything, and uh, employing natural materials to compute, which is like, uh, as you might know, quantum computers, the one on the screen right here. So quantum computers are something that is inspired from physics, which is uh, qubits uh, instead of the normal bits to compute. Uh, all this is fine, but there is something that has uh, inspired computing uh, in a very, very big way in the recent uh, past few years. Uh, can anyone guess what it is? Uh, just uh, write it in the chat box. Any guesses? What could be something that has inspired a lot of people? I mean, not uh, some a lot of problems were solved and like i think it has changed the way we look at internet anyone can't think of anything, though. Okay, uh, then I'll tell uh, 
what it is. So all of you guys might have heard of chat GPT, right? Yeah. So chat GPTs are usually based on neural networks and not neural networks exactly. They are something called transformers, but this neural networks, they're inspired from how human brains work. So I think most of us uh, have used chat GPT to a very good extent. But again, this is something that has been inspired from nature. And I think uh, yeah, every one of us should appreciate how nature helps to find out new ways to solve problems. Now let's go to how has physics inspired. Like all this stuff, uh, yeah. I have put a what a uh, lot of fans in this picture. Can any one of you guess why? Why have I put so a picture of so many ants there? You can write it in the chat box. So I can see. Raised hands. So basically, even ants have a uh, hello in hello. Yeah. Yeah, the ants, I mean, they said that they have some chemicals which help them to find the roots. I mean, they help in forming the networks. So kind of inspired from that. Yeah. yeah, so basically uh -huh. ants have something, uh, I mean, there is, there is something called as ant colony optimization, which is also an inspired uh, algorithm. And yeah, a lot of the stuff you see are inspired from either biological or physical processes. And uh, that is what uh, why like this is one of them. Let's go to, yeah, so physics inspired computing. We'll talk about uh, a few more algorithms and everything that is inspired from physics as we move along the lecture. But firstly, uh, yeah, what is it? So what it basically is, is that uh, there are some principles in physics which are used to develop an algorithm that will be used to solve some problems in some other domains. So uh, yeah, it can, these approaches sometimes are better than the normal methods that are used to solve problems. So where do you think uh, these methods are applied? Like usually, what do you think? How do you think these methods have in, uh, helped humans solve problems? So basically, I'll be covering a particular set of uh, algorithms called optimization problems. So I'll be mostly dealing with optimization of uh, various stuff. So optimization problems are everywhere. Even uh, machine learning is an optimization problem. Or be it, uh, I think all of you guys have uh, than linear programming in your uh, schools, which is again an uh, optimization problem. But there are also more uh, optimization problems like uh, optical, optimal power flow problems or energy management, uh, clustering, electronic circuit designs, antenna designs, etc. So all these problems they are kind of solved. Uh, using physics uh, inspired algorithms as well as normal algorithms as well. So before jumping into all those algorithms, I would just like to uh, go a little bit into what is optimization. So optimization, as the name suggests, is finding the optimum of something. It might be the maximum, it might be the minimum, but 
uh, it is to find the optimum case. Say for uh, uh, what example do I give? Yeah, uh, for a runner, for example, he has to optimize his speed, like to get the maximum speed. While uh, for a long distance runner, he might have to optimize his speed as well as his energy because people are not able to type in chart. Huh? Why is that so? Just give me a second. Are you guys able to type in chat now? Just give me a second. Uh, is that something to do with the channel settings? I think so. Uh, Vedansha, are you? Uh, oh, okay, yeah. I think it is fine now, right? People are able to type. I can see that. Yeah, cool. Yeah, sorry for that. Uh, So where was I? Yeah, I was explaining uh, optimization. So yeah, like I said, for a short distance runner, it might be time and speed that he has to optimize. While for a long distance runner, he has to also take into account energy. Like he has to conserve energy properly so that he covers the entire distance. So this optimization as such differs from uh, case to case basis. It's not the same for each and every uh, single thing. And uh, before I jump into uh, what is optimization, uh, I mean, uh, more stuff, I'll just give a little bit of vocabulary and uh, of the optimization problem. Let me just share the screen of the. So is the screen visible? I don't think so. Wait, um... Yeah. I assume screen is visible now. So some of the stuff in optimization problems that uh, 
just you need to know uh, we have something called as the objective function. So you usually denote it by fx, and uh, this is the objective function. So uh, my handwriting is legible, I suppose. So what is the objective function? The objective function is the function that you are trying to minimize or maximize. Basically the function that uh, you will uh, optimize and you will have various variables. Let's name them X1, uh, X1, X2, X3, X4 and so on. So what are these? These are the variables and you have complete control over them. So you can change uh, your these are your parameters which you can like change as per as you want. And then you will also have constraints. So constraints, for example, it could be like X1 uh, plus X2 should be less than some number, say 100. This is just a linear constraint, uh, but it could be anything. It could be a, a quadratic constraint or it could be anything. So many of you guys might have uh, done the linear programming or uh, this thing. So a LP uh, program, as you might know, you will have Z is equal to uh, some F of X comma Y. And then you will So this is your objective function, which you try to uh, maximize or minimize depending on what you need. And then you will also have something like uh, X plus three Y should be less than 10. And you will have something like uh, uh, Y plus let's say y minus x is greater than 5. And then what you used to do is, uh, I hope everyone knows this uh, thing where you used to draw some graphs. So it will be something like this. And you'll also have some constraints like x greater than 0, y greater than 0 or something. And you consider uh, the feasible region like this. And then you consider the extremities. So optimization problems are uh, again, they are similar to this, but in they can span and dimensions. So yeah, imagining something in n dimensions is not very feasible. Like you might not uh, think of uh, having, yeah, these are LPPs, but uh, there are several other uh, this thing. Yeah, I see a question in the chat box. What does minimizing and maximizing exactly mean? Uh, say you have something like fx is equal to uh, 1 minus 2x squared. So now what is the minimum value this uh, function can attain in all space? So X can be anywhere. X belongs to the set of real numbers. What is the minimum value uh, this function can achieve? But this function might be dependent on many other things. That is what uh, this thing is. 
So no, here I think it's the maximum value, but yeah. Uh, so in LPPs, you do this. In basic optimization problems, again, you'll have some space based on some constraints and everything. And in that space, you're supposed to find the best uh, space, uh, the best solution. So other simple example is y is equal to x square, where you know that this is the minimum. So these are what basically optimization problems are. And now let's go to uh, some different types of optimization problem. So there are continuous versus uh, discrete optimization problems. So what are continuous continuous optimization problems? Uh, they are basically optimization problems where you uh, the space is continuous. So search space, which is basically where all your solutions can lie, the feasible reach it. Uh, sometimes it might be R also uh, in some cases, but wherever it is continuous, it is not like based on like only certain integer values it can take or something like that, then it is continuous. Discrete is when it can take integer values as well. Constrained versus unconstrained is also one more thing. So, uh, constrained versus unconstrained. Uh, so basically, constrained means you are con uh, constrained, uh, putting some constraints on your search space, while unconstrained is on whole space. That is, say, in uh, X comma, if it is a two dimensional space, you are searching the whole of two dimensional space. Uh, that is what uh, constrained versus unconstrained is. One more uh, this thing, uh, classes of optimization is deterministic versus stochastic. So, what is this? Uh, deterministic versus stochastic. So a deterministic process is something that will happen according to a given set of rules. So there is no ambiguity or there is no probability. A stochastic process on the other hand will be something that has some probability. So uh, say something like, okay, tomorrow is a Sunday. That is deterministic, like you know for sure. But saying something like tomorrow it may rain, it's a probability. So even in optimization problems, there are some uh, stuff which are like deterministic. So you start at particular points and go on and stuff like that. And then there are also probabilistic. So you start and you take certain steps according to certain probabilities which are again randomly generated and stuff like that. So that is deterministic versus stochastic. Uh, so wait. So there are also certain other uh, optimization techniques like uh, gradient based techniques are there. So uh, have you guys heard of the gradient descent? Yeah. So that is also a optimization technique. You have something like this and you take the gradients here and then decide where uh, which direction you go to and then attain the minimas and assets. And then 
there are like uh, certain algorithms. So there is something called as exact algorithms. So any idea what are exact algorithms? Uh, no. Anyone else? Uh, so without any conditions is not exactly. Branch it up. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's obviously a method to solve problem, but what do you think exact uh, focus on the word exact? I think you'll be able to spell it out better. Okay. Uh, so say something like uh, you have this. And you certainly know that this is the minimum. And you can exactly reach the uh, minimum of this particular uh, function. But when uh, your objective function gets very complicated. No, it's not to solve with the same set of constraints. Uh, okay, I'll tell what, yeah, I'm explaining that right now. So you have a very complex uh, n-dimensional space, which is like, say, uh, uh, let's say around 100 dimensions or something. And you, you have to, uh, yeah, you're on the right track. So it will have one global minima and algorithms which, get the global minima, they are what uh, exact algorithms are. So they search the entire space and get the global minima. But getting the global minima when you have a lot of uh, dimensions, it's not really computationally reasonable. It will take a lot of compute power and a lot of time, which is why we uh, shift to something called as uh, heuristic algorithms. So what do you guys think heuristic algorithms are? Uh, linear regression is not uh, exact algorithm. Since it, it does converge, but uh, no, once you attain the minima, yeah, it is, uh, is like, it does not uh, change anymore. So you can maybe say it's an exact, but again, it's uh, linear regression doesn't always give you the uh, best. Uh, Linear regression doesn't always give you the global minima. I mean, yeah, they sometimes might give you local minima as well. That's the thing. So similar to the right, yeah. Yeah, heuristics, that's what it is. So they are algorithms which are more quick, uh, less computationally expensive, but then again, they might not be finding you the most optimal solution. They'll find something that is right. Don't understand linear can uh, Okay, I don't understand linear can be used anywhere. I don't uh, understand like, what do you mean by that? 
not all uh, uh, functions are like based on linear uh, linearity. Like there are uh, logistic or exponential relations as such. So yeah, yeah. Exact algorithm means that uh, an algorithm that can get us the exact answer. So that is what exact algorithms are. Heuristic, on the other hand, are something that optimizes, but not to the. Uh, you are not sure if it's the global minima, like if it's the most optimal solution. It will give you something that is optimal. So those are uh, uh, heuristic solutions. So this heuristic here, it means. You know in Greek. So. Yeah. Not following Q and A part, I'll just disable that. Yeah, that is what heuristic is. It might not. It gives us an approximate solution which is good enough to work with. It's not exactly like uh, exact algorithm. So again, exact algorithm will uh, more so you can think of it this way, I suppose, like uh, you. Yeah, heuristic is quick, but it may not be optimal. That's true. Uh, yes. We work with the uh, heuristic algorithms whenever we cannot use an exact algorithm. Uh, exact algorithms are not always feasible. So that is the main thing. Uh, so heuristic algorithms, they mean to know in Greek. Like uh, that is what heuristic means. Uh, so yeah, they provide a good uh, this thing and these heuristic algorithms are usually inspired from physical or biological processes. Say, yeah, I talked about ant colony optimization. There is something called as swarm optimization and uh, particle swarm optimization, PXO. And then we are going to talk about uh, today, we are going to talk about two algorithms. Uh, central force optimization. And gravitational search algorithm. So these two are again heuristic algorithms that I used. They have been used in various uh, domains and have shown to give good uh, uh, yeah the last this thing I think I told that uh, we work with heuristic algorithms whenever we cannot use an exact algorithm like when it is computationally too expensive we just go with heuristic ones Uh, I hope that is clear. Okay. Uh, so these right here, uh, usually heuristic processes are uh, stochastic processes. And also they are population based.
but this is a deterministic uh, algorithm. So both these algorithms, they are based on uh, Newton's law of gravitation. I hope everyone knows what Newton's law of gravitation is. Okay. So what is population based algorithms? Stochastic deterministic I have already told about. Population based as in, so say in you know, a n dimensional space. Okay, I've been using a lot of n dimensional space. Think it as three dimensional space. So in three dimensional space, you start off at uh, in a normal, uh, say something like uh, a linear regression. You start off at a point and uh, converge to the minimum. But in population based algorithms, what you do is you start off at multiple points and based off that you uh, converge based on how everyone else is performing. So, so you have a population, you have like the M agents and they get information from each other. So this is what usually uh, population based algorithms are. Now uh, I'll formulate what gravitational search algorithm is. Both uh, central force optimization and gravitational search algorithm are pretty much this same thing with some differences in. Oh, OK. Uh, say it's a 2D space. I'm just drawing like a plane here, uh, but consider like uh, it has its own bumps and uh, uh, valleys. So there are something like uh, there are. So it's a 3D like a 3D plane where there are uh, bumps and everything. Uh, so in a just like a linear regression or something like that. You start off at one point, say the minima is here. You just uh, converge to this point. But if you are. Uh, but on a, in a population based algorithm, you start off like uh, so these. Let me use a different color for the. So all this your red circles, whatever. So they are your agents. Oh, I'll uh, tell you how it is uh, stochastic. Uh, I'll tell uh, it's it's in the formulation how it's stochastic. Uh, so basically, you have these many agents, and you assign something called as fitness function. So each and every uh, this thing uh, decides based on the fitness function of the collective, you decide where uh, to go. So where the global minima might exist. It might not always be global minima, but yeah, where the most minimum of the minimas. So instead of having just uh, Okay, uh, let me explain it in a thing. So you have something like this. Okay. So say you start off here with a single particle. Now using something called uh, like linear regression, you'll just uh, directly end up here, which is again not a. Uh, Global minima, it's a local minima as you guys can see. But if you have something like three, four particles, so 
now based on all this information you can like uh, so this will say okay i have found uh, lesser uh, uh, optimization that is better than what you have found something like that so that is what uh, you have multiple starting points and also there is information transfer you somehow say like based on various uh, formulated such that you have some sort of information transfer. I'll tell how that happens for uh, gravitational search algorithm. Is that clear what population based? Uh, there is not exactly a need. Sometimes you don't really need the global minima, but uh, it's not necessarily global minima also. It can be maxima or minima, whatever. So why global optima say anything? Optimizing uh, as much as you possibly can is better than having something that is like uh, not really that good. Say, for example, you want to optimize how you uh, go around the city. So obviously you will have to like, uh, you have your car, you want to go around the city. You won't obviously go to the, uh, something that is in one corner and then goes to somewhere else that is in the next corner and then go somewhere in the middle or something like that. You would obviously follow some path that is, uh, you know, saves you fuel, saves you money, etc. So, which is, and again, global minima in these kind of cases is not really that necessary. You can work with something that is better than the random case. That is what I just wanted to. I hope that is clear. So. Uh, gravitational search algorithm. Uh, you know Newton's law of gravitation, which is g m one m two by r square. I hope everyone knows this. So also, you know that. Uh, force is equal to mass by acceleration. So one thing, uh, yeah, this is two particles. Uh, so I think there is some sort of delay between uh, me writing here and. Fine. Uh, yeah. One thing about uh, these uh, in gravitational search algorithm, or even actually this thing. So you know that you think this gravitational constant is a constant, but G depends on time. So it is, it depends on time as this. So beta is a very small number, which is to be determined based on various data. Uh, so this is the time uh, it has been since universe was born, and uh, this is the current time. I mean, this is the time at which universe was born, and this is the current time. It, yeah, T naught. Right. So this is kind of what makes. Uh, also, there are some other stuff that makes it. Fantastic. Um, uh, yeah. And you have. Uh, there is active gravitational mass.
and there is passive and there is also inertial moves. So, no, this is not, uh, I mean, the gravity, uh, gravitational constant, that is, I'm not exactly sure, like, that is a paper in itself that I haven't gone through completely, so uh, they have proposed that there is, that gravitational constant isn't uh, same at all points in time. Uh, this algorithm isn't based on uh, Big Bang. So what are this passive, active, and inertial now? So active gravitational mass is strength of gravitational field. Yeah, so this is uh, just something that is assumed like we have taken this for the sake of the algorithm so that. Uh, OK, yeah, something that I haven't explained here, so that is uh, common in population based algorithms. Mm, there is something called as. Uh, exploration and exploitation. So what do you think exploration and exploitation mean? Or why we usually use this? I'll actually start off by giving an example here. Uh, so you have many restaurants in your city. You'll have a lot of them. So what you do is, yeah, it's explore something, explore something. So you have, say, 100 restaurants in your city. You visit a few of them based on like uh, reviews or something. Uh, you visit them. You visit a lot of restaurants. And that is your exploration. What is exploitation? You find that some restaurant serves really good food. And now you go to that restaurant continuously and try different items on their menu. So is the this is. Yeah. Uh, that basically is it. Uh, so. Basically, you know that that particular restaurant is good. So what you do is you go there continuously and uh, uh, try different items in their menu. But also sometimes you feel like exploring and going to different restaurants as well. So this is the basic idea behind exploration and exploitation. So why this is done is to avoid local minimas. So you don't want a local minima, which is like. So. You have something like this. You don't want to be stuck here. Which is why uh, you have exploration and exploitation. Say you got something like this. Then you would obviously uh, you will again explore. If you get something like this, this is probably fine. Which is what uh, to avoid global minima, uh, local minimas, you do this exploration and exploitation. Yeah, it helps if in finding more optimal points. Okay, so I hope that is clear. Yeah, so coming back to active mass is strength of gravitational field and uh, passive mass is strength of 
how it interacts with the graph. Yeah. Uh, exploitation is, uh, okay. You know that a particular uh, area is good enough. So consider this is a three dimensional space. There is one more dimension into the plane. So you know that around this area, yeah, when you use that particular location more often, so around this space, you can go more often and find more points that are uh, optimal. That is exploitation. Is that clear? Okay. So, yeah, passive mass is how it interacts, like strength of interaction. And I hope everyone knows what is inertial mass. What is inertial mass? Yes. Okay. It's just the resistance to change in state of motion, which you have learned in, I think, ninth grade it was. Uh, uh, gravitational search algorithm uses all the time. Linear regression, uh, I mean, it might have a lot more uh, in one dimension, I mean, two dimensions, yes, but uh, if you have more and more this thing, it will be, yeah, in more complex cases, you need to do both exploration and exploitation. Okay, so GSA, one thing, uh, so GSA is basically gravitational search algorithm. I'll be telling it as uh, GSA now. Uh, so they have taken one thing, that is they have considered the force to be inversely proportional to one by R instead of the usual one by R square. This is just a convention that uh, the algorithm was formulated as. So now, how is the algorithm in itself? Say you have M agents. Uh, and each one uh, you initialize with certain positions. Say you have X, I. So this is the, this is your ith agent and uh, the position will be like X, I, one. So the one, two, three here represents the uh, dimension in which that position is. And so on, and you have n dimensions here. So this is what, uh, and I also will be from uh, one to m, because there are uh, m agents. And now you define uh, the force in one particular uh, direction. So what you do is you use uh, G of T into M. So this is force between I and J at time T. So you have uh, active mass of J and then you divide it by 
the distance between the two particles and as well as at that particular time and you add an epsilon. So why do you think this epsilon is added? Anyone? And then also multiply by the distance in that particular. So this is how uh, uh, this is how the force and GSA is. So basically, uh, it was found experimentally, like doing a lot of computations that uh, uh, inverse of R provided better results than inverse of R squared. And that is the reason why R was used. Uh, and epsilon is uh, no epsilon. OK, epsilon is used because of the reason that you don't want the distance between them to be absolutely zero. So what will happen if. Uh, two particles like are in, I mean, computationally, it's very much possible, right? Uh, although in. Uh, physically, it's not possible to have two objects at the same spot, but computationally, there might be possibilities. So then this will shoot up and this will become infinity. If R becomes zero. To avoid such case, we are uh, adding an epsilon. Uh, yeah, and now the total force is calculated. And now this is where the main, uh, like the stochastic term comes in. So the total force uh, D, I mean, in the deep dimension on J gets calculated here. And what you do is you sum up while having a random integer. So you have something random multiplied by the above force. So this is where the stochastic nature of uh, gravitational search algorithm comes in. Uh, is that clear? Someone had asked that question, right? Okay. So now again, uh, there are some more uh, steps, which is you have your. Uh, oh, this method just uh, OK, I'll show you the I have a code which I'll show in a few minutes. So it can be used for a lot of stuff. So I have used it to like optimize something called as the Ackley function, which is a standard uh, function that is used to like Check the convergence of functions. So, yeah. Please repeat the stochastic part. Okay. So, you have uh, multiple bodies here. Uh, you have one, two, three, four, five. You have a lot of bodies. Uh, and on this particular ob uh, agent or body, whatever. So forces from all these are acting. If you just have it. Uh, if you have it multiplied by one, it will be a deterministic process pretty much. But to have some kind of stochasticity, what we are doing is we are multiplying it by some each and every force by some random integer. So it will be say some uh, 0 
this will be 0 0.1 and so on. So this is why. So the probability is a uniform distribution between 0 and 1, like random integer. So yeah, I had to mention that. Random integer is uh, between 0 and 1. It's a uniform distribution. But then again, since it's probability, uh, it, uh, the algorithm is stochastic. Is that clear? And then in the end, what you do is you have your distances. You had some initial position. Now you update that initial position with some uh, accelerate, like you have the. Let me first define how velocity is defined. So you have velocity at t plus one. And uh, this will be again. Random times velocity at t. Plus acceleration at t. Acceleration, how do you get that? You get that by this thing. Using this thing. That will be covered in the next, uh, like you won't get uh, much, just the flavor of quantum computing will be covered in the next session. And then you also have X at T plus one. These are your uh, basic uh, laws of motion that are derived from. Uh, yeah, I think you all know the. V is equal to U plus AT. The same thing, but uh, these are defined a little more with some randomness and everything. And then there is also something called as fitness. So fitness is basically which is most near the this thing. Uh, uh, and Based on what you want, whether you want maxima or minima, you choose uh, what kind of fitness you want. So you either like for a minimization case, you take minimum of fitness. Fitness is basically your score. It's a score assigned to like how close it is to the optimal solution and as such. And uh, yeah. So this is the best fitness. And worst fitness would be. It's done. So now also what is done is. You have I told you have young agents. So out of the M agents, we only select K agents which have the best fitness, like which are closer to the optimal cases. And that closest optimal, uh, okay. I think I didn't really explain how exactly this works, right? Okay. So uh, consider how this algorithm works. You have some solar bodies. Uh, some bodies. And you know that gravity is always attractive and it attracts towards the one that is most heavy. So here what is being done is uh, all the agents are attracted towards uh, agents which has the highest mass. So that is what this is about. I think uh, I'll show it to you in a uh, code. Like I have some. Yeah. 
So I hope the code is uh, visible. So yeah, here there is something like the Ackley function. This is called the Ackley function. I won't go into how that is defined and everything. And uh, yeah, I have uh, evaluated this. Uh, I'll first show the, yeah, so. I don't think I can use the, So here, uh, I hope this is clear. Uh, you can see that uh, the particles which are near the optimal solution, they have higher mass, which is they have higher fitness. And this around here is where the optimal solution is. And uh, you can see the ones that are very far away, they have very less mass. You can consider like them having uh, them being smaller is them having lesser mass. So ideally what should happen is they should converge at the point where there is optimal solution because that is where the highest mass will be. So you can see that everything has started to come closer because the higher mass objects are pulling them in. You can see here. And as you go, Closer and closer, you can see that uh, we are getting closer. I think I have a video, right? So you can see how. Uh, they get closer and closer to the optimum and then. Yeah, they're slowly converging here and you can see they have converged. So what is meant by converging is that they have just attained the optimum value. So you can see that all pretty much have converged at the zero. That is the optimum value from here, which is rank, which was random. Any questions regarding this? Yeah, yeah, I'll share the notes. So, yeah. Do I need to go through this code? I'll share the code as well. So you can see this is your uh, best value and uh, this is the number of iterations and as you move forward in time, uh, you can see that the particles are attracted towards the optimal solution. Just like how in gravity, everything is attracted towards the one with the highest mass. So any questions, I'll stop for a while here. For any questions. And then uh, we shall move on to something called as physics inspired neural networks. Uh, yeah, so masses are not something that we choose. So uh, masses are something that uh, is based on how much uh, 
closer to optimal solution, like how optimal the solution is. Uh, yeah, if that is clear, what P, uh, what uh, the y axis is basically your uh, value of the function, uh, and that is to be minimized, and that is what uh, you could see in the graph. No, the, the fitting is again, uh, it's based on this algorithm, based on gravitational search algorithm, where like you have all the yeah you have the or uh, do you want me to go through the code i'll share the notebook Physics inspired neural networks are not quantum neural networks. They are uh, something else. We'll go through. Uh, yeah. So I was talking about how uh, I share my. So I was basically talking about how uh, neural networks are inspired from brains. So wait a minute, why is this so? Position are uh, okay. Uh, the position of those masses are first initialized randomly. So at some random positions in space, they are initialized. Whatever your uh, graph or wherever your space is there, in that space, you initialize the positions randomly. Is that clear? So now, uh, yeah, I was talking about how uh, neural networks are something that was uh, mostly inspired from brains. So any of you have idea what neural networks are? OK, uh, I'll just uh, start off. So neural networks are something that works similar to. Yeah, they uh, inspired from human uh, brains, human nervous system. So. These things right here. They are called as nodes or basically the neurons in uh, human brain or humans uh, system. Uh, so these nodes are similar to this thing and each of the node is connected to each and every other node here in a neural network. I'm not connecting everything because it will be a mess. Uh, so this is what it is. So you have a set of nodes, each connected. Yeah. Uh, so there are connections. You get some input here and you get some output here. Say for something like you touch a hot object. You get the input as heat. 
and the output is uh, your action, your reflexive action. But in a neural network, your input could be, say, a picture of a dog. And neural network will predict that it is a dog. Yeah, there are input layers and hidden layers in this one. So this is basically the idea behind uh, a simple neural network. Uh, there are various uh, complications behind like what they are. So each node has uh, each connection has something called as weights uh, and biases. And there is also something called as, uh, yeah, uh, activation functions, at each uh, layer. Uh, these are all like uh, simple uh, activation function, just add some function on top of uh, the, value that you have at that particular node. So you can kind of think of it as like uh, you have some uh, some data and you decide what to do with that data based on applying that after applying that filter. So uh, yeah, it's kind of like a filter and yeah, that is pretty much it about a neural network. But main work in the neural network happens through something called as loss function. So does anyone of you know what a loss function is? Yeah, yeah, there are different types of uh, neural networks, but I want to focus on physics inspired ones. Why they are. Yeah, they are cost function. Cost function and loss function is the same thing. So basically, uh, for a linear regression problem, uh, you have points and you have a line. Now you have various distances. Pardon the not so straight lines and everything. So this distance right here varies. And yes, loss function should be less to obtain optimization. That is correct. So that is what you do in neural networks. You optimize the loss function such that it is the minimum. And there yeah, is something called as uh, mean squared error, which is basically mean squared, uh, which is you have your actual data. Uh, I mean, whatever the prediction is there. And uh, your true value. squared, one by uh, n times. So this is the usual loss function that is used. So a loss function is your basically objective. This is your objective function, which you are supposed to minimize. Or maximize depends on how you uh, formulate this. But uh, say you have done a physics experiment and you have obtained uh, some certain data points. Uh, say you had done uh, a damp, so I'll be talking about damped harmonic oscillators. So there is a spring and you have a mass hanging. So in an ideal case, you know that it should be a oscillation which does not 
uh, reduce. But in reality, it will be something like this. Right. It will be damped. So uh, say you did this experiment, the experiment of damped harmonic oscillator. Now, what you do is you have certain points here. Say you have point here, 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 here. And after a certain time, you weren't able to get the points. So now, when you fit a curve, it should be something like this, but you don't know what will happen after this particular point. But since you know how this equation behaves, you'll be like, okay, this should be something like this. Right. But a machine learning model, it won't know what to do. So what will it do is it will come here until here and then it will be like, OK, fine. This is how I'll go. So this example that I'm giving right here is a very simple example. But one thing is we can fix this. So I just define the equations for how uh, this thing is done. So the damped harmonic oscillator is defined as such. Uh, the friction, uh, the second term is the friction term. This will what the damped harmonic oscillators will be. Uh, where to use it, where to use what? Uh, this uh, physics inspired neural networks. They used uh, pretty much like, say you want to, uh, yeah. So scientific machine learning is a uh, upcoming field. Like I don't know how many of you have heard about it. So anything to, say predict some natural phenomena like I I had seen it being used for seismology, which is to uh, predict earthquakes and stuff like that. So there you know the equations. So you use the like uh, instead of normal neural networks, physics inspired ones for you. So again, coming back to what this is. Uh, I'll actually show you a very nice uh, this thing. Just give me a second. So you can see the three uh, uh, animations here. So this one, can you guys see this? Can you guys see this now? Yeah, okay. So you can see that the first one is a physics inspired neural network. This is an animation of a uh, damped harmonic oscillator. This is something that we already know that I'm discussing, just so that you get an idea of how these are used. These can be used to much more complex uh, uh, problems in physics or anything, like wherever differential equations are used fitting it. And this is what, yeah, like I said, this is what a neural network will do. It will come, it will arrange itself until the points are there, and then it will be like, okay, I'm going this way.
screen which I was sharing is not number to share. Uh, yeah, prediction will. Uh, this is very ideal case that we have assumed. Your uh, actual data from your uh, data points, it won't be uh, very ideal. So, if you have done experiments in your school and everything, you will know that uh, you will have points like. Something. Let me see if I have to. to so you will have point something like this. So when you try to connect something over here, you will have a line like this. Uh, here the data points were generated such that it was along the line of uh, damped harmonic oscillator. Which is why it was very easy to minimize the distinct. And besides, this is a very ideal case that we are considering. Which is why prediction seems very accurate. This is also something we know, like for whoever has learned uh, harmonic oscillators, it is something that we know is something like this. Uh, but in reality, it won't be the case. So yeah, I'm say okay. This is the equation of your uh, the oscillator. So what you do is in such cases. For your loss function, which is your MSC, you add a term such that it is, uh, you add this particular loss. Uh, which is defined something like this. So, summation for all this time and this time. So you have L, uh, which is your loss function, which will be your mean squared error, which I have defined. So I have defined I have defined mean squared error here, which is your uh, difference between the prediction and the actual value. But to this factor, you add your physics loss, which is Plus squared. So this is what you add so that you get a better uh, uh, yeah attendance li link. I'll send that. Uh, I'll also uh, share the QR code. Uh, yeah. So you have this. So what we are trying to do here is, I'll take the example of the very simple uh, harmonic oscillator. 
So you have d square by In uh, just give me a second. So you have this uh, uh, is it writing now? Yeah. So you have d square x by or d d square is equal to minus omega square x. I think this is something standard that uh, everyone will uh, everyone has seen, I suppose something that we write as x double dot minus plus omega square x is equal to zero. So what we do here is that we try to minimize this. So in your experimental data from the graph we that we get. So in a normal neural network, You'll try only minimizing until one particular point and then go off. But here, since you try to minimize this for all space, yes, this is the simple harmonic motion, SHM. Uh, what happens is, uh, even if there is no data, it will continue to minimize its error, which includes the physics part. So basically you are telling the network that there is some physics involved, learn the physics behind it. Because usually the neural networks are like, okay, I'm given this data. I have uh, this particular, so this is the particular output for that particular data. But the physics behind or whatever the science behind them, the neural network doesn't flow. Which is why you have something. Uh, uh, yeah, you teach the physics behind it so that it accurately uh, match to the this thing. Again, I have some code of the same, uh, which I'll share now. Uh, any okay before that any questions about like physics inspired neural network anything because i didn't really explain uh, neural networks that well so yeah you can unmute now whoever has raised how the hand. do you uh, add it to the like how do you teach the physics to the network like oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so your loss function, uh, which I told, uh, this is your uh, optimization function, right? So you yes. have something called as MSC, which is uh, uh, so you have the mean squared error, which is the error, like how differing it is from uh, your actual points. So you try to reduce your mean squared error. That will tell it to stick with the experimental data. While you have this particular term, 
which is your equation. If you notice, this is your equation. This is your equation of uh, uh, harmonic oscillators, which are damped. So you are telling while minimizing this, also try minimizing this particular function. This one. So this is how you teach the neural network to minimize, uh, to study the physics. Yeah, the attendance will be recorded as well. So for this, I have much simpler code. So I'll just, uh, yeah, any more question? You can either raise your hand or uh, If nothing, I'll go on to show the code. So this is the code for uh, uh, this physics inspired neural networks. So what I've done here is I have uh, defined the solution first of all. So uh, I hope this is visible or is it not? Yeah, now it should be visible. It's visible, right? I assume this is visible. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it's visible. Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, okay. So this first function, what I've done is, is just uh, to generate some data points as your experimental data points. So uh, it's just getting the actual solution because you know the actual solution. Uh, this is not, this won't be the case every time you will have to get the data from some experiments. Uh, and these are just uh, helper functions. Uh, and now uh, define a neural network. So, uh, okay, I don't think I'll be able to go into everything of, uh, like this is how you define a model, uh, basically the model architecture for a neural network. So you have a fully connected layer here and one more fully connected layer here and a linear layer in the end. Yeah, so you have three layers here, uh, which is one, two, three, and then uh, yeah, it basically is a simple neural network. And uh, yeah, this is where the, you have the X, uh, which is some random points, not random points from zero to, uh, zero to one, 500 points. Yeah. And then you have Y, which are your experimental points uh at these locations and now you can see okay yeah here you can see these are the experimental points that you have generated artificially which i have done here so yeah can anyone say why uh i've used this thing as a d is less than o w naught
Okay, uh, torch library is used for like all sorts of machine learning uh, programs. I think yesterday you guys uh, used uh, Skykit learner. I'm not sure what uh, the last session. Yeah, so this is to avoid cases of. Uh, so this is this goes into the physics of it. There are cases like under damping, critical damping, and uh, over damping. So in the over damping case, what happens is it never oscillates, and critical damping it just has one oscillate. I mean, once it goes down and then it again stops oscillating. But for under damping part, it has an oscillation that frequently uh, that is like with time it goes down the frequency of it. So, which is why we have this. Uh, so I can actually show you. Yeah, it kind of works, but it is just saying that uh, you have to always have D less than. Uh, if is if the condition is not satisfied, it won't do anything. But assert will be like. Uh, this is a required condition. Please fulfill it. So, yeah, and you can see this is the uh, training data we have, and uh, this is the exact solution. Now, so this is where training is done. So I have uh, put it for. And let's train it for say 500 steps with uh, 20. So, did you guys in the last session use SkyKit Learn? I'm not sure what you guys used for the machine learning in astronomy part. Yeah, SkyKit Learn, right? Yeah. So, SkyKit Learn is something that has the basic uh, algorithms, while Torch is uh, also something that is widely used in uh, machine learning, more so for like very complex uh, uh, algorithm. I mean, yeah, architectures and stuff like that. Uh, So basically, yeah. Uh, that, yeah. So you can see it starts off as nothing but a straight line, and then based on it starts bending, and you can see that by two hundred step, it has almost formed the this part of it. While yeah. And then after a certain point, it will not move much. It will be very much stagnant. While a physics need 2000, 20,000 steps here. A sign will say it's having 500 steps with 20 as well. So you can see how a normal neural network works here. And Yeah, 
Okay. Not learning anything. Let's see something like Uh, this should work. It will take a little time to train and everything based on how fast your computer is. And yeah, this is a lot of steps. So I can actually just show you the. So this is what it is in 6000 step. step. Maybe I can decrease this to 600 and show you various. Yeah, you can see it has gone from this. To this. And uh, yeah, I forgot to mention about one thing here, the green dots. You can see the green dots there. What do you think the green dots are there are for? So it's supposed to be till 11, 1, right? Yeah, I'll share the code. I'll share the code in the Teams channel itself. Yeah. So you can see this has almost become exact solution. Not almost, it has become the exact solution. I share this code with you guys. Uh, yeah. I think uh, that's it from my side. If you have any questions, you can ask. I just shared the listing well, the QR code. This is the QR code for, for the feedback slash attendance. Hello, sir. Yeah. Sir, that green line, it is the loss functions were showing you now in that graph. That uh, green dots. Yeah, these green dots are where you calculate your uh, physics loss. Yes, huh. That's so loss functions. Yeah, so this is where uh, your physics, uh, like I told you, there are two parts to the loss function, right? Mm. So the physics loss function is calculated at these points. Yeah. Okay. This is the yeah feedback slash attendance. Uh, 
Okay, uh, hope you guys had uh, learned something from this session. Uh, in the next session, uh, we'll be covering a few more uh, more interesting algorithms than this one. Uh, the uh, gravitational search algorithm. Will, there will be more interesting algorithms as well as uh, giving you guys a flavor of what is quantum computing, like how it is inspired from physics and everything like that. Uh, hope you guys uh, hope to see you guys there as well. Uh, that's it for the session. Uh, we'll share the feedback. Uh, sir, uh, sir. Yeah, yeah. Where we can, uh, where can we get the, uh, that feedback form in Google link? Uh, is this uh, feedback? Uh, QR code not working. Mm, not so. so oh, can okay, you give yeah. the link? It will be better. Yeah, yeah. Link will be shared in the channel. Uh, time varying gravitational constant. I'm not sure if uh, what I'll actually. I'll share the paper uh, which proposes this time varying gravitational constant. Uh, we can look into it probably. Yeah, the feedback form is also uh, sent. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys.